Hello and welcome to the Gold Goats and Guns podcast. It's episode 8. My name is Tom Luongo and we have a lot to talk about. It's Tuesday, December 17th, 2019 and the Inspector General's report is here and it's a doozy. We're going to talk about the big picture this report paints as well as how that interfaces with the big geopolitical story stretching back more than 20 years. Actually, it's really fascinating how the deeper you dig into this thing, the deeper it gets. So, but before we get to that, I want to remind you that you can follow my work over at my blog at tomlawongo.me. You can follow me on Twitter at TFL1728. Live streams happen every Monday at 8 p.m. and every Friday at 8.30 p.m. EST on YouTube and DLive. Warning, I'm a bad boy with a potty mouth and I'm not afraid to use it. You can look for my regular columns over at Strategic Culture Foundation, Money and Markets, and my new gig over at CCN.com. And you can also support me as a... Br- verified publisher, but also anyone else who is by downloading and installing the Brave browser where you can get paid in crypto tokens called BAT for voluntarily being served ads as opposed to Google. Now, moreover, Brave severely limits the amount of spyware following you around the internet and helps you protect your online privacy while saving you time and bandwidth by blocking all those data snoopers, etc. that are feeding the growing surveillance state. It's now fully functional on both iOS and Android, which is very, very cool. Uh, lastly, you can support me over at my Patreon at Patreon slash Gold Goats and Guns, where you can sign up for the either the private market reports, which I publish every Wednesday and Sunday, or you can get the Gold Goats and Guns mo- uh, monthly newsletter designed to wrap up all the geopolitical chaos, global macroeconomics, and shifting cultural and technological trends into a retail investor-focused portfolio strategy designed to help you make sense of a world going mad. All right. Out of, let's get all that out of the way. Now let's talk about Michael Horowitz's report, because this thing's massive. So Michael Horowitz is the Inspector General of the FBI, the, FBI, the Department of Justice, and uh, his report came out in uh, the other day. And while his ultimate conclusion, the headline conclusion, is that there was no political bias, he only meant that in terms of, when you look at it carefully, he only meant that in terms of the initiation of the investigation. The actual implementation of the investigation, the actual prosecution of that investigation was horribly biased. And his report makes that abundantly clear. And as bad as the Horowitz report is from that perspective, and throwing shade on Comey and McCabe and, and all of the, uh, all of the other people involved, Strzok and Page and how they all knew Christopher Steele, all this stuff. And I mean, at the end of the day, this thing is so big that I don't even want to know the details. It makes me actually sick to my stomach to like have to fill my brain with enough of this stuff. I get the basic picture here. They wanted to get Trump. And what I'm going to talk about today is the reasons why they wanted to get Trump, the history of why they they wanted to do this. So remember two things about this, okay? One, Horowitz, by his own mandate, couldn't actually investigate everything. That's going to come with John Durham's investigation, along with whatever Rudy Giuliani uh, picks up and, and dispenses independently. And uh, he was apparently on Laura Ingraham's show last night explaining you know, just how bad and how obstructionist uh, former Ukrainian ambassador uh, Janet Yavanovich was in trying to hold back any information, any whistleblowers from Ukraine coming over to the United States to testify to let everybody know, no, this is really bad. The, the Bidens and everybody are absolutely... Um, they're absolutely as dirty as they possibly can be. And you'll note that we have Chuck Schumer coming out the other day saying, well, we'll approve whoever the, the, the Republicans call for, uh, for witnesses in the Senate trial, but just not Joe Biden and Hunter Biden. We don't need them. Oh, yeah, absolutely we do. Chucky. But as far as, you know, all the details of this stuff, people like Lee Stranahan and Lucy Commissar have traced all of these connections, and it's crazy how deep this rabbit hole goes. And then when you interface some of that with the stories that Martin Armstrong tells about Browder, Bill Browder and Edmund Safra over at the Bank of New York Mellon and, um, and their relationship with uh, Yeltsin and Putin and all of that, you realize just how big this thing is and that it all ties directly back almost completely for the last 40 years to Bill and Hillary Clinton. And that's why this happened. The Clintons absolutely activated all of their assets all around Washington and in Europe and around in order to build a case, to build this situation so that they could spy on the Trump uh, the Trump campaign. They could use that as oppo research against him to win the election and then sweep it all under the rug. And then once it 
once he won, which no one ever expected, and the reason why Hillary didn't show up the next morning wasn't because she was so distraught that she lost because she really wanted to win. It was because she had to figure out how in the hell she was going to get herself out of this because she knew exactly how guilty she was because she knew exactly what she'd done and she knows exactly how vindictive, venal, and just downright mean Donald Trump actually is because she, for once, went after the wrong person. Not because Donald Trump is some paragon of virtue or anything, because he's not. He's a gangster. He was trained by one of the best gangsters in the world, Roy Cohn. And that's why Clinton, a gangster herself, knows that she's in trouble. So, what do you do if you're the prime acolyte of uh, Alinsky? You attack by accusing your opponent of that which you are guilty of. That's Alinsky Tactic 101. And that's what she did. That's what her people did. And that's what they've been doing for the last three years. And it's shameful. And it's vile. And it's caused untold amounts of damage in the country and around the world. And they don't care. These people are vandals. They make the Joker look like a Catholic priest who hasn't diddled little boys, for Christ's sake. It's that bad. And I fully believe at a certain level that both Trump and even William Barr who is very much a compromised figure, finally said, this is enough. Enough that is enough with these people. And maybe it's just a matter of, you know, we're going to stop Bill and Hillary. We're going to stop her and all of her cronies and all of the, the, the garbage that they have pursued and they have layered over the world. And they're going to stop them. That Barr and that Trump at some point was able to convince Barr to join the fight, help him fight the Clintons and get rid of them once and for all. I think that's what this is about. It's not about, and if that's Trump's idea of MAGA, well, great. If he does that before the end of his, uh, his presidency, be it at the end of this term or the next one, okay. I'm okay with that either way. It doesn't matter. That would be a Herculean task to just survive this. But understand that this is going to be about Durham. This is going to be about, and, and Giuliani and in the future. So. Um, it's very obvious that all Horowitz could actually do was talk about the FBI's violation of their own procedures, the abuses of those procedures in order to secure the FISA warrants and all the rest of it, which we've known for two years were corrupt to the gills. But now we have yet another layer of, another imprimatur of validity on that interpretation. Great. So that's where we are. And, you know, it's funny, I was listening to the Duran the other day, and they were talking about this, Alex Alex and over the Duran, and, and Alex Christoforo was going on, and I was like, saying, I don't get it, I don't understand, they had to know that this was, that this was just dumb, that this was just stupid, to, to like, play this game for as long as they have, and, and I'm sitting there listening to him going, Alex, come on, man, it's not stupidity, it's hubris, it's arrogance, they never expected to get caught, they never expected Clinton to lose. You know, you have to remember, and I've said this before about in relation to the European Union's leadership. These are not impressive people. Jim Comey's not an impressive figure. Neither is Andrew McCabe. Neither is Peter Strzok or Lisa Page or Bruce Orr or Christopher Steele or any of the rest of them. These aren't impressive people. Maybe Steele is. But they've just always had the board so heavily tilted in their favor. They've never really had to, like, run a good operation. They, they, They brought up, you know, the difference between... Um, uh, you know, Brennan and Clapper and, and, uh, and J. Edgar Hoover, you know, Comey and J. Edgar Hoover. And there's a Comey got caught up in all this presidential shenanigans and, and acted in a partisan manner. And when, you know, Nixon uh, approached Hoover about doing the same thing back in the seventies, Hoover said no and then turned on Nixon. And Hoover wasn't stupid. He's one of the most vile men ever. But at the end of the day, he understood how to play the game better. And I completely agree with, uh, with Alex and Alex on that point. So. It's fascinating watching all of this. So one of the things that Lee Stranahan pointed out, this is something I'm just going to kind of jump around here a little bit. One of the things that Lee Stranahan pointed out in the Horowitz Report. So as good as the Horowitz Report is, it's still trying to whitewash the Clintons' involvement in all of this. Uh, he makes a note about the, I just watched a periscope of his over the weekend, about page 116 where uh, Horowitz describes, you know, a longtime Clinton associate or a longtime Clinton donor, that was it, and someone else. And those two people that are involved in that particular part of the report are Sid Blumenthal and Cody Shearer. And these are people that go back with the Clintons to the 60s. 
I mean, Sid Blumenthal and Hillary Clinton have been, you know, have been peas in a pod since 1968. I mean, as long as I'm alive. Okay, this is the kind of thing we're talking about here. So even Horowitz is trying to whitewash this a little bit, and yet you can't get away from it. You've got Sid Blumenthal, you've got Cody Shearer, you've got um, Derek Shearer, got uh, the Ziff brothers and their and, and and their connection to now Bill Browder, which Lucy Commissar traced recently. Uh, she was on Fault Lines uh, on Monday morning, and she's just got a blog up on her post on her on her website about this. Uh, about the Ziff brothers and how they employed Bill Browder and Herman's Capital to buy over 200 million shares of Gazprom when they were uh, against the will of the, the Russian government and how it's all this big tax laundering scheme and, and all of this stuff. And that's so much of what is, that's got Browder in trouble with the Russians. And it's, it's all really, really awful, right? You've got that angle on this. And that goes, that then ties into Edmund Safra. It ties into the rape of Russia in the nineties. It ties into Solomon Brothers and long-term capital management and all the same people who were involved in long-term, the failure of long-term capital management and, and all of that, right? All of that, all the same people. They're all like on the boards of each other's companies and, 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 and all, they're all tied in together. Every bit of it. Robert Maxwell and Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein, they're all part of the same machine. It's all in the, it's all in the same, they're all in the, they're all in the, they're all, in, they're all peas in a pod together. They're all, it's all one big soup of disgustoids, for lack of a better term. Hanging around together in a hot, it's all, it's a, it's a big hot tub full of disgustoids. And, you know, the slime that coats the surface as these people all get out at various times is beyond comprehension. That's what we're dealing with here. Okay. That's how big this is. And when you think about it in those terms and think about how big it is, then you absolutely understand why it is they can't let this go. Because if they just let Trump have his win, the entire legitimacy of the last 30 years of U.S. foreign policy falls apart. Everything falls apart. MI6 falls apart. The Mossad falls apart. The CIA falls apart. The State Department falls apart. The DOD falls apart. Congress falls apart. Everybody's guilty here. Every All roads go through Ukraine. And that's why this can't end. And that's why it's going to continue until it's all out. It's either all out in the open or they finally just off Trump. I, I, I don't see how it gets out of here any other way. Because... They knew that they couldn't go after Trump. They couldn't let Trump win. It wasn't because he was an outsider. It's because he was an outsider that was close enough to being an insider who finally said, you know, that's enough. And at a certain level, Trump's not going to be bought on this because it's the whole purpose of him running for president in the first place was to stop this and defeat his ego and to put his people in charge. And if he's feathering his own nest along the, along the way, well, you know, I would, I'm not, you know, of course he is. In his mind, he spent billions of dollars of his own money to do this. I think, you know, he's probably thinking, yeah, well, you know, the, the world owes me a few billion back in return for, for cleaning up their mess. That makes sense to me. That, that makes sense to me. So, you know, I don't need Trump to be Jesus here, right? I don't need him to be orange Jesus. I don't need to have him have his motivations be pure or anything along those lines. I just need him to get the job done. I don't care how he does it. Because at this point, the whole situation is so corrupt that if you have a guy like Trump who's only trivially corrupt or who has a warped sense of, you know, of, of altruism, for lack of a better term, fine. Okay, go with it. Because who else is going to do it? I've said from the beginning that Donald Trump has a sin- sincere group of skills and personality defects that make him the perfect person for the job ahead of him. So we're three years into this now, and it's interesting to see how it's playing itself out. Because at the end of the day, I really do believe that Trump wants to solve the Middle East. He wants to make the world safer for Israel. He wants to solve North Korea. He wants to pull the troops out of Afghanistan. And he's perfectly willing to repurpose NATO if necessary. But he's just not going to have the United States pay for it anymore. He knows that the European elites just think that the United States are, that the United States should be their cash cow and that, that we're just a bunch of wayward colonies who've gotten uppity and have got a lot of money and that all that money should be sucked back into the into the sophisticated bosom of the European colonialist elites who still think they run the world. I mean, that's, you can see this. It's like written all over everybody's face whenever they get together at NATO or the G8 or any of this stuff. It's so obvious. 
at a certain level, I just fundamentally believe that Trump's like, we don't need to be doing this anymore. Yeah, we need to let all this stuff go. But the the structure and the size of the, the Leviathan or the, the monster that he's poking here is so big. We're looking at like, you know, in geopolitical terms, this is kind of like, you know, Jorgamunder, the, you know, the world serpent from Norse mythology, right? It's like, how do you attack the serpent that eats the world? I mean, you know, that's kind of where we are here. It's kind of crazy. But we, what we've noticed though, and I've noticed in the last few weeks, is there are significant cracks in the process. There's significant cracks coming within the, within the power structure, right? So there was this article in Der Spiegel, the German weekly, about Bill Browder and about his lies relative to the Magnitsky Act, right? I mean, think about this, right? If all of this stuff about Ukraine and Russia turns out to be false, and then we find out that Browder and the Ziff brothers and all the Clintons, and they all know each other, and they've all been working with each other to try and stop, you know, this stuff from coming out and yada, yada, yada. Then we come to the conclusion, and then everybody gets to, comes to realize that, hey, maybe the Mag- Magnitsky Act was, um, oh, was passed under false pretenses by a grifter named Browder. Right, who was associated with Robert Maxwell, who's associated with Jeffrey Epstein and the Clintons and everybody. Whoa, ho, okay, hold on for a second. Everybody has to stop and and reassess everything. All of a sudden, we're now looking like the supreme bad guys of the world. We're now looking like the evil empire. We're looking like the first order, as a matter of fact, to make a Star Wars reference since we're four days away from the rise of Skywalker. So, I mean, I I, I look at this and I'm just like, you know, at some point, all this is going to break wide open. It's very clear to me here that at some point that's all going to fall apart. That whole narrative is going to fall apart. And then what happens when all of these people are exposed? And they have been exposed, right? And I just think I, when I, when I think about we, us going into the future and the potential for sovereign debt crisis and the terminal loss of faith in government, that's happening. We're seeing it in Brexit. We're seeing it here in the United States. The, the Democrats are pushing forward with impeachment, even though they know that it's a sham. That their art, that their articles of impeachment are, are quite frankly ludicrous. When you look at that, and I'll get into that in just a second. When you think about that, then you think, okay, now what? How are the markets going to react to this? How is capital going to flow around the world now when these people start destroying government structures and the, everybody's faith in government institutions in order to save their own asses. What happens then? The markets are already seizing up behind the scenes. The repo markets are, are practically frozen solid at this point. You'd think global, you'd think these people would stop, you know, their virtue signaling about global cooling, global warming, considering how the planet's cooling off quickly, so quickly that it's even frozen the repo markets. I, I look at this stuff and I'm like, we're on the precipice of something unbelievably big. While the IG report itself isn't that damning, it is that damning to those who know how to read it. And certainly those who know how to read it a hell of a lot better than I do, and they get it. And a lot of people are starting to quake in their boots. Because remember, at the end of the day, this is really all about getting Hillary back into the White House so they can go, they can cover it all up, sweep it under the rug. This is why she's going to re-enter the race. This is why bad stuff has been coming out about Biden, and this is why Kamala Harris is was was allowed to be destroyed and da, 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 all of this stuff. It, it was not that she didn't destroy herself because God, she was a terrible candidate. Hey, I'm going to pattern my campaign for president after the person who's been rejected twice in spectacular fashion by American voters. See you at the auto show, camel toe. I mean, it's crazy, right? Hillary's going to come back in the race if for nothing else, and because she needs to raise some money, hope that Goldman and Wall Street can get her across the line so that they're all protected here. Why do you think Mike Bloomberg's jump, jumping into the race? Remember, Mike Bloomberg is, you know, he was a partner at Solomon Brothers, and Solomon Brothers is right at the right at the the core of long term capital management and the the failure of Russia. They had to be bailed out and folded into Goldman Sachs and all of this stuff. At the end of the day, I mean, this is they, they, these people are all failures, and they've all failed falling forward and getting more and more billion and and, and being given more and more billions for failing, and the world's getting tired of it. This is why Mike Bloomberg is running. Aside from the fact that he's also going to be running a, a ridiculous data data operation in order to target votes, in order to try and change specific zip and just do zip code targeting, it's what he's doing. But it's it's more it's more than that. He knows that he's just as freaking guilty as the rest of them. No one wants Mike Bloomberg as president. He doesn't have a prayer in hell of becoming president. He's not running to win. He's running to 
ensure that if Hillary jumps back in the race, she has the best chance possible of winning. When you think about that in terms of impeachment and the timetable here, it's very obvious that the Democrats are trying to fast track impeachment in order to blunt anything that Durham is going to bring out. And Durham's already said he disagrees with the Horowitz report. The Washington, I just read an article at the Washington Post trying to, from a few days ago saying, you know, trying to downplay the disagreement between Horowitz and Durham. I'm like, uh, me thinks the lady doth protest too much here. This is obviously written by, you know, this was obviously approved by the CIA, this, this article. We're at a point here where something big is going to give in 2020. The Democrats are not going to accept this election. They're going to continue to hound Trump for whatever it's worth. Nadler came out the other day and said, it doesn't matter if the, the Senate acquits him, we're still going to continue to investigate him for impeachment. I'm like, dude, you impeached him, the, the Senate acquitted, and you're going to keep going? Okay, there's more sticks over there for you to build your bonfire with. I'll keep cutting them down and handing them to you. Okay, dude. I mean, I, I said earlier that these people aren't terribly impressive. I was really talking about Jerry Nadler. I mean, that guy's a freaking moron. I mean, at this, either he's so corrupt he doesn't know what else to do, or he really truly believes that the president is a traitor to his country. Either way, he's a moron of like epic proportions. None of this is going to fly. What we saw in the Brexit vote on Thursday in the UK is coming for these people, like hook, line, and shrinker. It's coming fast. I don't see how Trump loses as long as Connell rides herd over the Senate, which is still not convinced he will. I don't see how Trump loses. But you know, they got to remember something. The GOP doesn't want to win. Well, the GOP only wants to win on its terms, in the same way that the DNC only wants to win on their terms. They only want people running for president that they can control. That's the key. And there's enough people who are corrupted by this entire situation on the Republican side that I cannot trust that this thing goes to trial, that they don't, in the Senate, that they don't try and get past them anyway. They don't try and get, get rid of them anyway. I just, part of me just can't, just can't shake that feeling. But if they do that, they will have shut the door on the legitimacy of the United States government. And that would set us into, set the world in, on fire. And this is why the Dems don't know what else to do. They're like deer caught in the headlines. I mean, you look at Pelosi and she's just, she's just insane. She's been told that she has to do this. She doesn't want to do it. And she knows that if she stops running that, you know, she's just going to like fall. She's wily coyote having already run off the cliff and she refuses to look down. Fundamentally refuses to look down. It's side effect. She's got so many freaking facelifts and so much Botox. Her eyes can't actually go down. Her neck is so stiff that she can't actually bend it to look at her feet. Given all that, to close off here, I heartily recommend that y'all read as much of this stuff as possible. You know, follow Lee and Lee Stranahan, follow Lucy Commissar. Uh, they're all, you know, we're all peas in a pod over on Twitter together. That's probably the most valuable portion of my Twitter feed is the threads that I'm linked into, even though I don't start them. Just keep following the threads because when you stop to put it all together, it's so very obvious that this is going to get far worse before it gets better, even though it's so completely obvious at this point that these people are so guilty that we don't know what to do with it. The, the crimes are so big now, they can't even risk having a minor functionary like Lisa Page go to prison, like take the fall, because then there has to be a trial. And if there's a trial, there has to be discovery. This is why they don't even really want to go through the process of, of having a, uh, a trial in the Senate. McCon I, I honestly think that McConnell's call the other day that hey, if they if if they vote to impeach him, we're just gonna like call a roll call vote and, and dismiss it without ever going to trial. I think that's McConnell's way of covering everything up to ensure that there is no discovery, there are no witnesses called, there aren't there is nothing. It's like Jeffrey Epstein was never gonna go to trial. Okay, Paul Manafort was never gonna go to trial, Roger Stone was never gonna go to trial, okay? Martin Armstrong was never gonna go to really go to trial. Okay, because you don't put on trial people who actually know stuff that can hurt you. You shut them up. You put them under a gag order. We don't have a rule of law, certainly not in, the, not in the state of New York. Southern District of New York is so corrupt that there's no way imaginable you will ever get justice there unless your name is Jamie Dimon or Lloyd Blankfein or Paul Singer or the rest of them. That's, who's, that's who gets justice there. Everybody else, and they don't get justice, they just get acquitted. Don't expect much in terms of the final outcome unless unless something radical changes. Because once you start down that path, once you indict one person, it will balloon into everybody. And I don't even think Trump has the stomach for that. 
All right, this has been the Gold, Goats, and Guns podcast for Tuesday, December 17th, 2019. If you like what you heard today, give a like and subscribe. Do the thing. Let everybody know about it. I'd really appreciate it. Uh, I enjoyed doing this, so I had a good time. I hope you did. You guys be well. You take care. We'll talk soon. Keep your stick on the ice.